environmentalism offers a feminist theory of the yellow woman, filling an absence in critical race theory on Asiatic femininity. I'm excited to read this book because I got my master's in women's studies over 20 years ago where I focused my research on Asian American women and um, Asian American history. And at that time, there were very few books. And so 20 years later now, it seems really exciting to have a lot more Asian American studies theory books to read. And so in this book, she's really trying to create a feminist theory of what she calls the yellow woman. And she says in her preface, um, we say black women, brown women, white women, but not yellow women. Is this an outdated orientalist term or a theoretical black hole? So in the United States, of course, the um, racial dialogue is always this black-white dichotomy. And so we miss a lot of nuances when um, you know, we exclude Asian American women, when we exclude Latinx folks. And so Asian American women you know, really need their own theoretical space to understand their position in the society, in representation, in history, in immigration history, in policy. And what is behind how Asian American women are perceived and treated in this current context? So in her introduction, she, she sets up her objective. She says, I offer a theoretical frame that I call ornamentalism in order to turn our focus to the peripheral and the supplemental and to explore the transitive properties of persons and things. I want to track the incarnation of Asiatic femininity in Western modernity and its expansive embroilment with the ornamental and the oriental. And so of course she's playing on Edward Said's or orientalism concepts and talking really specifically about how persons become things, but also she wants to focus on how things become persons. And so in her introduction, she really delves into the history of uh, the first Asian women to come to the United States and how that's positioned against how black women have been perceived historically. So she talks about Sarah Bartman, the Venus Hottentot, and this iconic image we have that really still applies to how black women are perceived and presented within society. And she talks about A. Fong Mui, a young Chinese woman who was first imported by um, folks in the carnival world and later taken over by P.T. Barnum to tour major U.S. cities in the 1830s through the 1850s as a living museum and simply known as the Chinese lady. And so she was placed in, you know, these expo positions where she was placed on this set where there was all this ornamental decor, um, you know, pottery and Chinese draperies and, and furniture alongside her. And so she becomes just another ornament within this Orientalist scene. And so we see then this association of the Asiatic femininity of Asian women with ornaments. She becomes yet just another ornament. She's, she's a piece of porcelain. And so we hear that kind of reference still currently, like the porcelain skin. You know, Asian women can be signified by these objects, by these decor, and she doesn't even need to be there in a, as a person. And also, Chang talks about how um, the pictures, the picture of A Fong Moi and the objects that she's placed within really signify the colonial imperial history and the relationship between the East and the West, all the types of objects that were being traded. Chang says on, um, in the introduction, to speak of Asiatic femininity then is to speak of a style which claims specificity but lends itself to promiscuous transferability. Asian women are called upon or invoked by a specific style, but you can take this style and transfer it to someone who's not an Asian woman, and therefore they're still signified but easily transferred to someone else. So she's saying that the Asian woman doesn't even have to be present to um, signify this object. And so in the conclusion of her introduction, she states, the clear understanding that the origins of this term derives from a racist framework that is indifferent to ethnic and national specificities and to diasporic realities. So she opens her chapter one, Borders and Embroidery, with a sensational case uh, at the time 
that took place in 1874 called The Case of the 22 Lewd Chinese Women, as it was popularly known, making it the first time that a Chinese litigant ever appeared be before America's highest court. The unexpected and dramatic eruption of Asiatic female ornamentality during the course of the trial set in a 19th century courtroom packed with white men offers us more than an instance of Orientalist blindness and racist projection. So in this case, these 20 to 28 um, Asian women, Chinese women, were banned from disembarking from their boat because they were considered lewd, labeled as such. And unusually, they were, um, you know, took their case to the courts and actually won. And so just this understanding of the position of Chinese women at the dawn of Chinese immigration to the United States. As we know, of course, it was mostly male workers that came here to work on the railroad, to work in, um, you know, many manual labor um, areas, and Asian women, Chinese women, were banned from immigrating to the United States. And those few women that were allowed in were labeled and deemed as, um, you know, sex workers, prostitutes, and um, and therefore that still lingers with us. This this concept of the the Asian American sex worker prostitute, and so in the same first chapter, she presents two photographers who were known for taking photos in Chinatown in San Francisco, and one of them was um, Arnold Genta from 1896 to 1906 and he presents several of these images of especially um, you know Asian women in this ornamentalist objectified manner and the the picture of friends is very interesting because it it portrays the photographer with his subject matter in this objectifying you know image because the title is Friends, but yet it's this older white man dressed in a dark, somber suit holding this small child who's very, you know, a, a small child, an Asian girl, a Chinese girl who's dressed in this very ornamental fashion and he's looking upon her and she's looking forward. And um, the image, you know, is, is quite disturbing. Um, but presents this kind of way that the photographer is looking at these young Asian women. So in chapter two, Gleaming Things, she opens it up with a discussion of the iconic Anna Mae Wong, ar arguably the single most famous Asian American woman in the 20th century. And so Anna Mae Wong is an early 20th century um, actor who is in silent movies, black and white movies, and enters into talkie movies, portrayed this kind of Asiatic femininity and this Asiatic beauty. But still, for how many movies she was in, she's relatively unknown now. But she really portrays this kind of uh, style that um, the author is um, alluding to throughout the book. So unlike Sarah Bartman, who was displayed n naked as an embodied embodiment um, of black women, she, the author here states, ornamentalized femininity has always relied on this, um, the, the imagery of not of naked skin, but of ornament, the excessive covering and decorations that supposedly symptomize the East's overdevelopment and hence feminized and corrupt civilization, in which, you know, she mentions Freud's essay, Fetishism. In chapter three, Blue Willow, she focuses on the 2015 New York Museum of Natural History and Science show called China Through the Looking Glass. And it uh, presents mostly 140 European American fashion designers, and they're interspersed with the museum's Asian collection without any kind of discussion, historical context of why these white Euro-American fashion designers images are placed next to these um, Asian historical objects. And so they kind of conflate this historical objects that are real with these um, Euro-American fashion designers interpretation of orientalist fashion and style within their 
um, textile artworks and ceramic um, sculptures. And so in this chapter, she definitely brings, she definitely makes her point of how the Asian woman, the yellow woman can be signified without even being present as a person with these images of these dress and these sculptures that signify Asiatic femininity. In chapter four is called Edible Pets. And she focused specifically on this short co story called Bottles of Beaujolais, uh, originally collected in a volume called Pangs of Love. And so it's a story of an Asian American man, and, but his race is not signified. And he's in this Japanese restaurant, and this otter in the window, Mushimono, who is originally uh, attracts this white woman into the restaurant and this white woman Luna becomes the love interest of this um, Asian American man in the restaurant and so the man and the woman are eating sushi It's kind of tied together with the concept of eating flesh You have the otter in the in the tank that's kind of creating this inner species relationship between these um, you know three beings and then just the conflation of um, eating sushi, eating flesh, this um, exotic food. And she specifically opens her chapter stating that this chapter will trace the emergence of what I call the sushi principle, by which I mean a driving impulse in the text that reveals and revels in the delirious conflation between meat and flesh on the multiple levels of consumption, aesthetics, and effect. I suggest that the sushi principle is the eruption of the logic of ornamentalism in the realm of cuisine. And she goes on to say, what then does it mean to approach sushi as a food, a commodity, a cultural marker, a racial sign, an effect, a metaphor for species difference, and finally potentially a means of critical agency. So in this chapter five, Dolls, she talks about two movies in particular, Ghosts in the Shell and Ex Machina. She states, the figure of the yellow woman, I argue, anticipates this transposition well before the development of modern technology and modern corporate culture. This conflation of Asian femininity with the machine and with this kind of Blade Runner world where Asian women, Asian culture are portrayed as the background, the backdrop, but really these women themselves are not present as people, but just signified through um, the costuming, the body. And so she's stating that the yellow woman is a ghost within a ghost of a white woman. So the Asian woman is never fully human, but she's just a ghost that the white woman, who herself is not even a woman, but still a robot. But this chapter is interesting because we think of how Asian women are talked about in our society as robots, as not creative, as excelling academically, but not in a creative way, and that they are considered, you know, talked about as robots and implied, you know, in those terminologies. And so she looks at how the yellow woman now is portrayed in these science fiction movies. So overall, in ornamentalism, she's trying to create a theory of the yellow woman and to bring that term back and to understand our discomfort with that term? Is it because it's an outmoded orientalist term? Or is it because there's a black hole in the theory of feminist theory and critical race theory as she talks about? And so, you know, she's approaching this topic from this humanities perspective where she's talking about representations in museums, movies, uh, artwork, and then she blends in some of the early uh, immigration history of how Asian women have been created and processed.